Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from lunch. And thank you for joining us for our session on technical SEO. Some of the more astute audience members may have noticed that I am up here by myself. That is correct, because Mr. John O. Alderson will be joining us on Skype on this screen over here. He won't, therefore, be able to take any questions, but he is going to have a great session, which is entitled Crash Course in Technical SEO. You've tried, you, you have tried on and off page SEO. You've had some success, but now you're looking to kick it up a notch. Technical SEO may have the answer. How do you navigate these labyrinth worlds of robots crawling, spiders, JavaScript, and chemicalization? It all sounds rather complicated and, well, technical. But it doesn't have to be. In this session, we will show you everything you need to know about technical SEO and why it's important for your affiliate site. Ladies and gentlemen, coming live from Skype, Mr. John O. Alderson. Um, thanks for coming. I'm so sorry I can't be there with you today. Um, the problem with being a technical SEO is you tend to spend a lot of time in dark rooms indoors and not getting enough sunlight and exercise. So I've been struck down with a particularly nasty bug. Um, but I will soldier through and hopefully be of some help to you today. So I'm just going to share my screen and we can jump through this. How do I... There we go. Right, I'm hoping and assuming that you can all see this. Let's um, drag Simon out of the way and go into presentation mode. All right, so, um, so I'm going to do you um, 30 minutes, very, very top line, kind of get you grounded in the basics, help you get a feel for um, the things you might not know, um, some unknown unknowns. It's always helpful to know kind of where the boundaries of your knowledge are and to give you some um, quick tips as well so you can make some immediate wins as soon as you get home from um, IGB. So um, who am I? I'm John. I'm a technical SEO, a brand strategist, um, a WordPress geek, um, a PHP developer. Um, I work for um, a digital marketing agency called Distilled, who are um, very well known for um, things like our search club conference and our education platform Distilled U and a whole bunch of other stuff, yada, 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 yada. So um, I want to talk to you about um, a site that I built in 2011 as a bit of a hobby, <coughs> um, an affiliate site nonetheless, um, which is doing really, really well. Um, this is my side hustle and it's been growing um, for a number of years. So um, this only goes as far as mid-2014, but you can see that over a period of three or four years, it went from nowhere to generating the best part of a million sessions per month, uh, which is really nice. And that was done with building no links, with emailing no bloggers, with doing zero proactive outreach, with... Um, no comment spam, no guest posting, no spun content, none of the conventional kind of um, affiliate SEO tactics of the day um, with fewer than 100 or so words per page, which breaks every rule in the book of content marketing um, and with functionally zero budget other than 30 or so euros a month for some hosting and some other bits and pieces of tools, maybe a total out there of about $50 a month. I was generating a large amount of traffic that is still growing to this day and um, doing quite well off the back of it. Um, so why is this significant? Because I'm going to show you what it looks like. It looks like this. And my point is that I have spent an inordinate amount of time using this site as a way to learn and to improve my own skills to really understand what technical SEO can achieve and to granularly perfect every single attribute. So every single line of code on that page, I have made a conscious decision about which tags I use, the attributes that go into them, the values of those attributes, which order they're in, which ones I should prioritize above other ones, how they should work, how they should interrelate, whether I should remove the line spacing, whether I should strip white space, whether I should put a training slash on, whether it should be uppercase or lowercase or single quote marks, etc. All of those things I have thought about, interrogated, researched, learned, and optimized. Um, and that's the backbone of how this site has done so well to date and continues to do very well. Obviously, there's some other factors involved around content, marketing, etc. But the real core of why this has worked and why I've had cut through is understanding what you can achieve when you really, really focus on technical SEO and optimize for winning on technical SEO rather than just minimizing risks of leakage and reducing errors and kind of conventional thinking. Um, beyond that, I have a deep understanding of the back end as well. So this is an overview of how my server is performing and how it's configured and looks at things like what's the CPU load and how many people are concurrently requesting the site and what's the server doing to process all of those requests. There's a huge amount of information here, which I've spent just as much time getting to understand and saying, should my server have more raw firepower? Um, for fewer people, or should it be a kind of value curve, and should I prioritize quantity over quality? All sorts of those considerations and decisions have gone into optimizing so that it performs at peak. My deep concern about SEO and technical SEO is that when we started talking about and focusing about content marketing, which is a scene where a lot of you guys play, and we really start <clears throat> talking about technical optimization. And for clarity, 
on-page SEO and tweaking meta titles and tags and things is not the same as technical optimization. We'll come on to a bit more about what that means. Um, so why should we care? Um, because Google cares and users care. So a whole bunch of stuff that's like, this is as old as 2010, this article. So speed is an explicit ranking factor. Speed is an explicit conversion factor and how much money you make factor. Um, all the major search engines and properties are falling over backwards to give you the tools to help them understand the structure and content and nature of your markup, which gives you a direct commercial advantage. Even Facebook and the social map, sorry, the social brands that are involved in trying to empower you with the tools to help them better understand your content and how it forms that structured, which helps them, which helps your consumers, which helps you. Um, and tools like canonical tags and hreflang tags really are still phenomenally overpowered um, because so, many, so few people implement them conclusively or correctly. Just by doing things like correctly marking up your canonical tags or your hreflang tags means you can very easily consolidate a lot of what otherwise might be disparate value and take over markets, take over verticals, strengthen weak pages and sites and really regain, um, kind of rather than operating at 60%, you can operate at 200% very, very easily. Um, interestingly, there was a pivot happening. Um, and again, this is quite an old article, it's 2013, but um, a pivot from um, a world where it was okay to have a leaky site and to have technical issues to where now you really need to be thinking about um, the strength of your technical optimization as a competitive advantage or a disadvantage. And now rather than having a good platform um, helping you, having a poor or even average platform will hinder you directly. Let's get through some of this. Um, obviously, there's a huge amount of noise and security in SSL and HTTPS at the moment, which we'll come on to in a minute. So I spend a lot of my time um, at work auditing websites. So clients come to us and say, can you have a look at why this isn't ranking? Can you try and find some optimization opportunities? Can you help us make this faster, et cetera? Um, and I do a lot of that. I help work with our developers to implement those. And when they fix their things, they make a lot of money. This is not rocket science. When their sites are faster, when they load better, when there are fewer errors, when consumers have better experiences, they engage more, they convert more, they sell more, they make more money. When they don't, and when those issues sit in pipelines or go undiscovered, these brands decline, their rankings gradually drop, they start panicking, they spend a lot of time saying, can you help us understand why we've lost this ranking for this keyword or why this page has stopped performing quite as well and we spend ages going round and round in circles trying to understand that and the answer is just that they're not as good as their competitors and whilst everybody else is improving and making their sites faster these guys aren't reacting and they're falling behind so what is technical SEO? It's a huge field and it's worth just exploring that briefly. Um, everything essentially from hosting and service to CMS and templates, so the way your domains are configured to how you handle your media and assets, to your HTML, your CSS, your JavaScript, your content and the languages you serve that in, the networks and the partnerships you have with third party domains and platforms, even the legal constraints and setup of your industry and your company might dictate how you need to configure your server and your content and their relationships, how you interact with apps and other platforms like AMP and Facebook Instant Articles and progressive web apps and how that ties even cost as a technical angle is quite interesting that if you really optimize your websites you can spend less money running them and then there's an interesting opportunity to make more money by spending less on your infrastructure and then questionably you start bleeding right over into user experience and huge amounts of how users how users experience your website and how Google um, understands that and scores it and how they use that to either benefit or work against you kind of ends up falling in the domain of technical SEO maybe even brand because if the color of your logo and the whether you use a JPEG or a PNG to serve it impacts user experience and how Google understands that, then maybe that's technical SEO as well. So when I say that this is um, the back end of my site and uh, explains all of the nuances of how it actually works, actually this is a bit of an oversimplification because this is what it looks like today. Because that was years ago and it's evolving and it's maturing, the technology's changing and the approaches to best practice and the kinds of things we need to be thinking about and maturing a lot as well. So. Um, it's a huge amount of stuff to consider and it's absolutely terrifying and there's loads of it. Let's simplify. Technical SEO is um, having the ability to rank. So Google, like, boil down all of SEO into the simplest possible form. You need to be able to deserve to rank, i.e. you've got brand, you've got content, you've got things that people want, and you need to be able to rank. Google needs to be able to access and understand and index and crawl, all of that sort of stuff. We're talking about the entirety of that be able to rank quadrant. And um, that breaks down loosely into three areas, preventing and repairing errors, adopting new standards, and improving your performance. I've got 20 minutes left. We don't have time to scratch the surface of that. I'm going to talk at lightning speed and cover a whole bunch of areas which you can take away and go and look into um, on your own and start getting a feel for where you might have some opportunities. Um, interestingly, if you um, really want to accelerate that, as I mentioned, it's an unfortunate plug, I apologize, but we do have um, distilled.net slash you is distilled online university. We have a huge course about technical SEO, which covers a lot of this stuff. It's worth looking at that. Um, give me a nudge if you want some discounted access. Um, so 
preventing and repairing errors. Um, essentially, Google is really, really crap, really, really stupid. Still, despite their machine learning, despite all the approaches, they have to analyze, render, and try and understand what's going on with your HTML source code, with your JavaScript, and then interpret that into some kind of what's the user experience, what's this page about, how well is it doing, and ultimately, most websites are a mess. Um, if you're not already intimately familiar with these tools, this is where you start. So Screaming Frog um, is very, very cheap off the shelf. Sitebulb, I think, has a free trial. Um, Sitebulb's quite a new entrance to the marketplace. They are trying to compete against Screaming Frog, who are the incumbent. I would have a play with both. They both give you a slightly different view of what's going on your website, where the strengths and weaknesses are, and where the issues are. They both have strengths and weaknesses when it comes to things like crawling complex um, websites, or very, very deep websites, or very, very broad websites. Sitebulb, in particular, is very, very good if you have a particularly large large site or um, one with lots of archive content or one with lots of different categories. Screaming Frog is a bit better for kind of more conventional structures. These will give you huge amounts of insight into things like where are there obviously broken things? Where am I missing page titles? Where are my canonical tags balked? Where are there pages that I thought were important that Google can't get to? It will flag all of that um, straight off the cuff and then you can go and work through those fairly iteratively. It's all fairly well documented. They will give you examples of the kinds of things that you need to look at. Um, but yeah, have a play with Sidebulb. Very new, very interesting, um, a slightly different take on things. Um, the other thing um, I would definitely look at is um, Google is your best tool for understanding how you're currently doing with technical SEO because, um, I mean, if ultimately your objective is to help Google to understand what your site's doing, what it's about, and get into all of it correctly, trying to interrogate how well they've done that will give you a lot of clues. Just doing a site colon mydomain.com search and then some modifiers shows up some really interesting things. So this is a somewhat arbitrary example, but if you do site www.distilled.net minus in title distilled, I can find pages which have an inconsistent title tag structure with the rest of the site. Now, in the search results here, it looks like they contain distilled.net because Google's intelligently rewriting it. So how important this is going to be is up to is, is debatable. But you can start to probe for things. So for example, I can see very, very quickly in this that we have some pages that shouldn't be indexed, like a whole bunch of these user profiles are really thin and haven't been updated in years. And we have a whole load of pages where Google's spending time looking at, evaluating, and indexing rather than getting on with the more important stuff. So I would spend a huge amount of time just probing what Google's index for your site. You can do this here in Google much better than you can in things like Google Search Console and Analytics, you can get a feel for where the dead ends are and stuff. Um, also interestingly, things like um, my second bullet point on here, things like file type, colon, PHP, text, XML, ASPX, um, look for things which are shouldn't be indexed, which aren't pages, which Google's found and put in the index. If it's doing that, it's spending time on those rather than on the things that matter. The thing you will find a lot of is 404s, either directly through Sitebulb and Screaming Frog or um, through um, searching in the index. <clears throat> I cannot overstate the importance of managing 404s. Um, if nothing else, it's a direct negative user signal, which is likely to result in a bounce, which is likely to result in a lower propensity to buy. And whilst Google explicitly say 404s won't harm your rankings, they definitely harm user perspective and perception and experience. And those factors we know are direct ranking factors. So um, having a system whereby you monitor 404s as well as just finding them accidentally is really, really important. So things like analyzing server logs and looking for specific tools, plugins if you're on something like WordPress to monitor those, and to fix them in as close to real time as possible is really important. And yes, your site will have thousands and yes, you will need to maintain thousands of 301 redirects and lists of redirects, and developers will hate that, and it will pour, cause um, performance overheads when it starts to scale, but it's so important that you catch all of these and that you're not serving um, error states to either users or Google. You really want to be chasing 100% um, successful request um, kind of edge. If nothing else, people link really badly. Um, they will link to your site um, with broken anchor tags that include speech marks or spaces in URLs or typos and the like, and you're not close it properly. Assume that most of the people on the web who are linking are average Joe webmasters and not sophisticated. They're, the way that they link and the markup of that won't be great. And they will link broken links to you that result in workforce. You can catch that and you re can reclaim link equity through um, fixing broken inbound links. The other place you'll find some really interesting stuff is Google Chrome Developer Console. So um, hit F12. I don't know what the equivalent is on a Mac, but you can right-click a page, go to Inspect, and go to the Network tab. Refresh the page, and you get this waterfall effect of everything that's happening on the page. It's color-coded. It's itemized. You can click on each bit for more information. There's a readout at the bottom of when it encounters critical errors and issues. This is 
an exact readout of what your browser is doing when it's trying to load the page. And this is pretty damn close to the way that Google consumes it. It looks at every resource that's required, how they load, the interdependencies, flags HTTP statuses, looks at speed. You can, if, even if you're not intimately familiar with things like JavaScript and how all this works, you can spot issues. You can spot slow things. You can spot broken things. You can spot things which look a bit janky, and then you can interrogate further and investigate and do the research. Like There are a lot of errors at the bottom of this screen, things like this uncaught message and um, a 429 status on some external script. I want to look into that, find out what's going on, and try to work out if it's an issue. Um, on that, um, <clears throat> anybody who's still kind of opening um, browsers and viewing the source code to understand what's going on might want to rethink. So I'll come on to this in a bit more detail, but in an age when JavaScript powers an increasingly large amount of, a large amount of the web, viewing the page source gives you the information that's returned from the server when the page loads, but it doesn't give you what JavaScript then changes and the way that users and Google see the page. You need to be right-clicking on the page and hitting inspect or opening that Google Chrome console to look at Google's understanding of the page. This is a much closer representation um, of what they're seeing than um, what's in this. You can very easily write a piece of JavaScript that changes that title or changes that paragraph that won't be reflected in the source code when you view it view, view source. So what you think you're looking at maybe isn't necessarily what Google's seeing. Um, on that, when you're looking at this sort of stuff, it's really important to understand HTTP status codes. You can take your cat flavor um, or your dog, fra dog flavors, um, but essentially there are hundreds and it's worth familiarizing yourselves with some of the less common ones. There's some really interesting things like 403s, which sound like an error, but are actually really efficient. Um, you can um, serve 403s to say this content hasn't changed recently. And then if you're thinking about things like Facebook and Google who are coming and crawling and scraping and consuming your content, that's costing them bandwidth, it's costing you bandwidth, it's effort that they could have spent elsewhere analyzing other pages and content. If you serve an explicit HTTP status that says, actually, this hasn't changed since you last looked at it, you can save a lot of that overhead. Things like 410s, which rather than serving a 404 when you remove a page, you can say explicitly, this has intentionally been removed forever. It's really interesting because then Google removes that from the index much more quickly. Um, you kill the page explicitly rather than them just not having found it. It's worth looking into this and understanding a whole bunch of them. There are some really interesting use cases and all sorts of things that you might encounter in the wild when you're looking at things like Chrome Console. One of the biggest mistakes I still see to this day, despite this all being decades old, is people confusing and conflating um, robots.txt directives and meta robots directives. So let me say this really clearly for the avoidance of doubt. Robots.txt disallow rules prevent Google from being allowed to crawl a URL. It doesn't stop them from being allowed to index it. You can block a URL in robots.txt and Google will still decide if it has enough links pointing to it, if it thinks it's relevant, if it thinks it can guess what it is, to include it in their results. So you can think that you've blocked a page when Google will still include it and find it. Meta robots directives, which can be served on the page as a tag like in the code or can be served um, as an XHTTP header, which I'll come on to in a minute, or a whole bunch of other methods, um, tell Google what they can and can't do with that page when they visit it. So Google has already arrived at the page and you can now say, don't index this and or don't follow any other links from this. The intersect's really interesting, and this is where people really mess up, is they will block a page via robot, block Google from calling a page via robots.txt, and then put a directive on the page with a meta robots tag saying you can't index this. Google can't get to that page to read the meta in meta meta robots tag on the page. Sorry, I'm doing it now. They should name them differently. Um, if you block access, it can't get to the page to read the tag. So if you start to see interesting behavior and stuff which you want to block, which isn't blocked, et cetera, chances are you've overlapped those um, in a way that's not optimal. There's two really good Moz resources there which explain all of that, but in principle, these are very, very different things used in different ways. Typically, you will very, very rarely want to use robots.txt. Metro robots directives through tags or headers are much more powerful, much more nuanced, and much more flexible. It's going to be rare that the solution, the good solution, is block access to this. Much more common that the good solution is let them in, but then tell them that we don't want it indexing. If only because then it knows and it doesn't keep trying. Again, canonical tags, 2009, there's a phenomenal blog post. Um, people still get this wrong. Um, so there's a really nice example image here where um, widgets.com slash blue widgets color equals blue. Every example will be different, everybody's site's different, but in this example, blue widgets are, as far as my business is concerned, and my website is concerned, and my users are concerned, comparable to blue widgets. So the blue widgets color equals blue, all of the blue widgets are blue, so it's functionally the same thing. The canonical tag on both of those URLs should be widgets.com slash blue widgets. You are saying, 
here are all of the versions so for all of the versions of this URL, all of the possible versions, I want to point a signpost at the one explicitly correct version of this. People still frequently um, include the query parameters and variations they're trying to remove in the canonical tag. So in the uh, people will get this wrong and they will um, include the color equals blue component in the URL rather than removing it. And then you're doing the opposite of canonization. You're saying for any variant of this URL that you access, this is the canonical version, which splinters all of your and fragments all of your value. So a lot of this, you'll find issues and challenges which are outside of your control or you don't understand enough about the specific details of why the thing is broken or how it's broken, but you can see the symptoms. Um, you will tell your developers to fix it and then nothing happens. It's because developers are um, typically very, very difficult to work with. If they knew better, they'd maybe be SEOs and affiliates rather than developers, but um, we're stuck in a world where these are the guys who have to fix the thing. Um, learn to brief them really rigorously and specifically. I've got a nice framework, um, a whole bunch of stuff which I've linked to on slideshow and some documents, um, structured in a way that um, is really comfortable and familiar to them, which aligns to um, some of the other ways of working, which prohibits um, objections and unknowns, which um, tries to um, anticipate all the things that might go wrong. And then you say, What's the relative expected time, priority, complexity of this? What's the user story, which is familiar language to them if they're doing stuff like Agile? Um, what metrics does this affect in case they decide that they want to build some kind of internal business case? How much does this affect? How wide is it? What do we achieve by solving it? And what do we think the explicit components of the solution are? And you get bits of this wrong and they'll push back and they'll have a better idea on how to fix this. So the second page is not as important as the first page. The first page says, here's everything I understand about this in a format that you can digest. Now we're going to try and work and fix it. The success rate for getting things fixed and getting things implemented by developers from using this format goes 10 times through the roof. It's incredibly powerful. That fixes the broken stuff. The more interesting thing I think is about adopting new standards because um, you, Google is increasingly all about help them um, understand what your website's about, what's on it, and what you're talking about. Um, and the calling tools like Sitebulb, like Screaming Frog, will only tell you um, whether there are errors and whether things are missing. It won't tell you where you haven't adopted potential um, opportunities and issues which um, it doesn't have a footprint for, if that makes sense. So things you want to look at. Um, the open graph is a really big deal. This is Facebook's version of meta tags and meta descriptions where they take information on web pages and they try and understand the web. Um, it comes in the format of meta property OG tags. So you can say this is the title of this page, this is the type of this thing, this is the URL, here's the image. Um, you want to make sure that all of your pages and all of your templates have this and that it's correct. Um, there's a debugging tool you can get to on Facebook. Um, there's loads of documentation at ogp.me. But this is really, really powerful. Um, obviously, this is, uh, it doesn't affect SEO directly, but the nice thing it does is when people share your pages, it will pull through an optimized snippet, the right image, etc. And if you've got a better sharing experience, more people are likely to share it on, which means more people see it, which means more people link to it, etc., etc., etc. This is worth doing um, to increase the velocity of that kind of stuff. Similarly, um, schema and JSON LD are really, really important at the moment. If you've not started playing with this yet, it's definitely the time. This is um, so schema that was born years and years and years ago as a Moz post. It's come through multiple iterations. Increasingly, it's um, Google and other agencies preferred way of understanding what pages are about. So back in the bad old days, we had meta keywords tags now and, and descriptions. Now really Google want you to explicitly say, here are the entities and their attributes for this page. Um, and at a really tactical level, this gives you great exposure in search results. It gives you things like the Amazon example on this page where they've said in their page code, we are a shop called Amazon. Here is our logo. Here are our opening hours. Opening hours stock price, um, here are other properties. There's a huge amount of stuff you can do with this. It's very, very quick and very, very easy. It gives you huge amounts of exposure. Do not cheat or game this. Do not lie, cheat or steal. Do not misrepresent yourself because if you get caught, you get blacklisted at a domain level and you will lose access to all this. But things like reviews, things like product markup, all this sort of thing is really cool. And um, especially from an affiliate perspective because the big brands are slow to adopt this because it's um, a little bit outside the usual way of thinking. I've got six minutes. So I'm going to go super, super fast. There's lots to get through. I'm going to talk about AMP very, very briefly. Not yet looked at AMP. Do um, If you've got the technical capacity to make AMP versions of your pages, Google are pushing this very, very hard. It's a stripped down form of HTML and JavaScript, which makes your pages lightning fast, um, pretty much instant loading from Google. Really, really good for things like product pages and editorial, less good for services and lead gen, um, but really, really nice if you've got um, stuff which people are doing on the fly on mobile. 
If you haven't yet moved to HTTPS, you absolutely have to. Like your business will die fairly shortly if you don't for a whole bunch of reasons around user trust, browsers trust, um, uh, adoption of new standards, etc. Uh, Philly Vise, who's an ex-Google um, engineer, has a really, really good guide of about 10,000 words. Phenomenal over at that URL. However, typically most people will find that this is really quick and easy. You get yourself an SSL certificate. You follow the steps to install it. It takes about half an hour. It's really straightforward. In 1% of cases, it gets a bit more complex, but most of the time it's really straightforward. And um, the reason that's so important, one of the many reasons that's so important, because it allows you to adopt HTTP2, um, which is the successor to HTTP 1.1, which powers most of the web. Um, HTTP2 is your biggest performance and speed opportunity. So traditionally, websites um, load really slowly because they ask for one thing at a time. When my browser connects to the server at the other end, it says, hey, get me the page. Excellent, the page's got an image. Get me the image. OK, the image is followed by some CSS. Get me the CSS. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. HTTP2 just ask for it all at once. It means that all of your stuff loads much faster because it's loading concurrently rather than forming a big queue system. And instantly at the click of a button, this stuff is so easy to configure. It's literally a line or two in whatever your server is configured. Um, you can shave 30%, 40%, maybe even higher off your site if you're using anything more than a couple of images and scripts. Hreflang tags, I'm going to link, I'm going to gloss over all of this because there's huge amounts of depth, but Alayda Solis has a really good guide. Essentially, when you have multiple versions of a page localized either for different languages or for different territories. So you might sell the same thing to different people in different countries by different prices, or you might sell the same thing at the same price in different languages, or you might intersect both of those and have um, fragmentation by language and by territory. Um, hreflang allows you to explicitly say to Google, I, I sell blue widgets. This is the English page for the blue widgets. This is the German page for blue widgets targeting people in Belgium. And you can scale and extrapolate and extend all of that out. It's not a direct ranking signal. It won't improve your performance directly, but it will stop the wrong people seeing the wrong version of the wrong page in the wrong search results. So if I search for blue widgets, it will make sure that I see the English version in pound sterling rather than the French version in euros, which means that you get... Um, Maybe slightly less traffic overall, but you get a much better engagement rate, you get the right people, you get a lower bounce rate, you get better engagement signals, you get a better conversion rate, you make more money. Um, it also means that if your product is comparable in different territories and you can ship internationally or you do lead gen, there is very little reason not to internationalize. If you can afford to translate and localize and extend your service offering, this is really powerful. I'm going to skip through some of this because we've got lots of stuff. If you have already looked at AMP and you've got that far, the next thing you want to look at is progressive web apps. And um, this is the evolution of websites into native like apps. Google are all over this. It's a huge deal. Um, it's really easy to set up and you just make your website act like an app. And suddenly it has access to a whole lot of native phone functions. It can be viewed and browsed offline. Really, really powerful. Definitely worth looking at. So two minutes on improving performance. This has been done loads um, by a whole bunch of different people. I've got a whole load of talks, a whole load of talks things to a slideshow about performance. If you bump into Bastian Grimm at the conference, he's kicking around giving another talk. He is an absolute guru on this stuff, as are other people there. Have a talk to them. Um, performance is how you win in the market in the next year or so. Um, bear in mind that Google is stupid and lazy and rubbish and makes bad decisions and will quite happily get lost around your site. So anything you can do to help make it more efficient and faster is better. There are a whole bunch of tools you can use to visualize performance. Most of them are rubbish. Um, Google PageSpeed Insights, for example, doesn't add, which is the tool everybody uses, which looks like this. It doesn't actually measure your site speed at all. It gives you an extrapolated guess number score based on the things it looks like you might have done. So it doesn't actually measure performance. It looks for evidence that you might have done certain types of things and gives you a score based on that. It also gives you all sorts of nonsense things, like it'll say, you should leverage browser caching, and gives me a whole load of slow JavaScript on my site. Except none of that's mine. That's Twitter's JavaScript. That's the Facebook Connect API. That's Google's own JavaScript. I don't own that. I don't have access to it. I can't improve that. That's their problem. So it's really, really not great at um, kind of understanding your actual performance. Um, you want to look at... Um, Pingdom web page tests and GT metrics are really, really good. Um, new from Google is Lighthouse, which I think if I skip a few slides, there we go. Um, it's an in Chrome plugin that gives you a phenomenally sophisticated breakdown of all sorts of clever speed based metrics and will give you something to point your developers at. Um, it's also really nice for analyzing PWAs. I can't remember what I was going to say with this. Big images are big, make images smaller. Um, things like Kraken IO, uh, like images like really unsophisticated, make your images smaller. It's such an easy one on one thing, but people have huge images. Services like Kraken.io are really good for doing that quickly. I'm going to go very, very fast. SRC sets a thing. Use WebP. WebP is a new image format um, that makes images much smaller. It's better than JPEG, it's better than PNG. Your Photoshop can output it, other stuff can do it. You really want to speed your website up. You need to fix the initial connection to the server, which might happen across oceans and between different countries. And um, the best way to do that is to um, get hands on, open up some hosted 
buy some hosting from somewhere like Heart or um, Vulture or DigitalOcean, buy yourself a pack and go have a look, get behind the scenes into something like WHM and tweak the settings, have a play with understanding what's going on here. A lot of it is very well documented. You can click the question marks. This is terrifying the first time you do it, but you start to understand that your website is just running off a computer in a cloud somewhere. And when you start to understand that, you can start to look at things like what software versions is it running and how well configured is it and how much RAM does it have? Um, you do all sorts of stuff like that. Check your error log files. Errors slow down servers. Most servers are really bad at handling errors. And if your server's slowing down, your site's slowing down. Things like this are pretty scary, but you can start to work out where the issues are and point your developers at it. In 30 seconds or less, a lot of this you can do automatically with Cloudflare or your CDN of choice. Fastly is also really good, but Cloudflare will automatically give you HTTP2, automatically give you SSL, automatically give you WebP and a whole bunch of other stuff. You can click and include it really, really quickly. Um, and that's what it looks like when you do. So this is a site I'm building at the moment, but that's an entire load time of a huge site with lots of assets and rich media that's interactive, that's mobile friendly, that loads in less than 0.2 seconds. Because um, Cloudflare is making everything local and fast because I've compressed all my images because I'm using HTTP2, which means everything can load at once, a whole bunch of other techniques. Again, talk to Bastian. I'll look at some of my decks or his decks for tips on how to do this. Um, if you want to go really deep, play with New Relic, which is a back-end tool which gives you server-side stuff. There's a really cheap package you can install really quickly. If you're using WordPress, use Query Monitor to start to understand where things are going wrong and where your performance bottlenecks are. And in 10 seconds or less, skip through all of this. Again, you can look at all of this in the deck. Essentially, this is like, there's so much stuff here and it's so deep, but um, where you want to start at least is to stop mitigating against technical impacts. Like everybody is going, how do I fix a few things and stop leaking quite as much value and start capitalizing on technical opportunity. If any of the things I've touched on very briefly um, today are new to you, these are areas of opportunity because if it's new to you, it's new to your competitors and if they're slow and clunky, they're not going to get there yet and faster, better, more performance sites um, uh, win better visitors, happier visitors, more conversions, etc. I'm hitting 100%. So that's it for me. Take that, go look at the deck, click some of the links, talk to Bastion, talk to other people, um, and win like a rainbow unicorn kitten. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm sorry that was so fast. I shall um, pop back out of um, screen sharing if I can work out how to do that. But yeah, thank you very much. All right, John. very complicated. How do I... Thank you very much. Well, that was a lot to take in. Um, these slides will be online, uh, I think, uh, tomorrow or the day after on the PAC site. So you can go and go through them again, look up all the great tools.